Hello everyone and uh, welcome to C C conversation uh, winter semester uh, winter series 2024 I am Melin Mahale I teach at school and I am moderating this winter series titled technological practices as riyas along with my colleague Dipti Bhindarkar This conversation series is organized by CCT which is an outreach program conceived by the School of Environment and Architecture to organize conversations and dialogue in order to engage with larger architectural artistic and cultural discursive practices within and outside the city C conversation series was started in 2014 it is conducted fortnightly and every semester we curate curate it around theme which emerge emerges from our current questions and inquiries for this series of winter 2024 the conversation are curated around the theme of riyas and long dure questions as a practice a technological practice riyas involves a rhythmic engagement with the self the technological matter material as as well as the world with within which the practice is located for us at c riyas is systematic way of practicing a form of art or a craft with a long term commitment not to to not just learning it but also advancing the self and the form of practice in the process it involves routine discipline engagements isolation diligence play repetitiveness experimentation through which one arrives at the struggles with the long dure questions we explore the questions of practice and riyas through con conversation with six invited part practitioner who have been working with different medium across the different geographies this series is organized by cct and is partly supported by urban center urban center is conceptualized as a collective space it presents its node of dialogue ideation deliberation to carry out research and to communicate to urban planning design conservation and sustainable ur urban development today in this second session of the series uh, we have sankalpa with us sankalpa is practicing architect and academic he has been teaching at faculty of architecture sept university since 2008 he is currently holds position of program chair for masters in architectural tectonics mat at sap he is also co-founder of thumb impressions a collaborative practice involved in design construction and detailing sankalpa's talk today is revision and repetition of the same that is the inhabiting space which is concern of architecture is established when the relationship to construction and structure is indistinguishable whereas disagreement may surface on the space as the experimental ent entity the logic of interaction between force and material remains credible riyas is a discerning practice that identifies the underlying disposition in the relationship between material force and space and plays with it the pedagogy is a recognize the diversity in approaches but the mastery over the one he titles it as the pedagogy of the everyday welcome sankalpa today's just uh, quickly about the format of the session uh, sankalpa will present uh, around 40 to 60 minutes and then we will open the questions and answer discussions also this session is stream uh, stream on uh, youtube channel and those who have joined us they can post their questions and then chat with uh, we will collect from them welcome sankalpa thank you for inviting me um thank thanks for your kind presence uh it has been long after pandemic that we all are meeting together um i found this uh, title of the talk which uh, we all had shared challenging but uh, quite interesting this talk and uh, the work that i'm trying to do is adding up to a 
to a memorial lecture which I am supposed to do uh, in Pune in Feb. There are two parts to this talk. The first part of the talk is in the form of reading. If you hate to listen, then you'll have to bear with me for some time. And the second part is the visual one. Now, uh, I didn't want to do an extempore when it comes to formally presenting it, so I've written, and you can um, consider it a paradox, but uh, somehow I want to put some disclaimers um, on what I'll say. So the practice of writing is different from the practice of architecture. They are entirely different knowledge domains. Writing about architecture makes one writer and not an architect. You, you can be a writer trained as an architect. That's a different discussion. So writing about architecture is the practice in which the readers gets the author's perceived version of the content. To bridge the gap is worth trying. So I'm trying to say very clearly here that there is a distinction between um, experiencing architecture versus writing about architecture. A poorly constructed sentence may lead the reader astray or be lost in a maze of misleading meanings. Conversely, in a poor worked out architecture, the material will still follow the principles of structure and construction for its stability. There is no scope for slippery meaning as there is no scope for imagining a brick floating on other brick without eating mushrooms. Today's talk is in two parts so that the scope of misleading the audience can be averted as much as possible primarily when the technological practice of architecture is being explained. Let me build a quick historical technological context within which all of us are operating, creating, modifying, rejecting, and improvising the available technology. Throughout history, the architectural milieu in India has predominantly featured many structures constructed utilizing brick and mud mortar, subsequently plastered with lime mortar. The rationale behind this approach was motivated by the optimal allocation of resource and a practical strategy to mitigate erosion of unstabilized mortar. This otherwise could have been averted by using large overhangs of which we don't find significant examples. Historically, in many parts of India like the Gangetic Plains or Godavari Delta, traditional dwellings were primarily characterized by their load-bearing construction which often consisted of either load-bearing walls or a combination of load-bearing walls with timber posts. The resource-oriented decision-making in construction, widely adopted in previous times, involved the organization of materials according to their availability of resources in different regions. This approach influenced the selection of finishes and sizes for structural elements offering unique identities. Nevertheless, the advent of cement precipitated a gradual decline in the utilization of lime, a conventional binder until then employed in construction. The rapid setting time of cement and the demand for efficient pace of construction were influential factor in this transition. Over time, improvement in the cement supply chain coupled with policy backing facilitated the widespread availability of cement in the open market, signifying the cessation of bureaucratic controls of license raj. As a result, the aesthetic qualities of present-day architecture have been notably shaped by the imperative for fast construction and cost efficiency, which is a slow and steady departure from the past. The shift to cement and the coming of reinforced cement concrete, RCC, instigated the widespread use of frame construction techniques and resulted in a fundamental transformation of construction practices. The rapid need for expansion of available space for utilization and commercialization in urban areas post liberalization played a significant role in, the hast in hastening this transformation. Within the realm of architecture, the imperative to optimize floor space propelled by market forces has substantially impacted building design and construction practices. The increase in pressure coincided with the development and widespread implementation of air conditioning technology, 
which facilitated the design of building with reduced sectional area to outside. Conventional strategies of achieving thermal comfort, such as implementing overhangs, brisk solely, and sectional articulation, have progressively been replaced by alternative approaches. Using glass films as environmental coating materials has become prominent, particularly with the introduction of double or triple glazed openings. This advancement enables architects to achieve optimal indoor temperature with, without solely relying on sectional design strategies. The advent of neoliberal economy has further prompted a substantial shift in special practices, especially within the construction domain. Within the economic framework, the significance of land value takes precedence, resulting in the prioritization of swift construction schedules over cost factors. This transition emphasizes the importance of construction speed, leading to a need for creative and advanced technologies designed for efficient building construction. The change in emphasis has a significant influence on the construction elements. With favorable circumstances for mass production and standardization, a range of building components commence being produced in standardized formats. The reliance on conditioned environment in commercial and residential structures has reduced openings to merely visual connectivity. Consequently, in the case of large-scale apartment complexes and commercial buildings, the emphasis is placed on creating controlled environments, then focusing on cross-ventilation. The prioritization of constantly or, or the prioritization of constructing tightly sealed air-conditioned environments has prompted a reassessment of architectural preferences. This has resulted in the widespread adoption of standardized openings and diminished sectional articulation for climate in the current building process. This transformation exemplifies a multifaceted interaction among market demands, technological advancements, and architectural responses. The transition from conventional approaches to standardized climate control settings represents a substantial shift in perspective affecting contemporary structures, visual, social and ecological and its ecological dimensions. Over two centuries, India's architectural evolution has been intricately woven with the shifting dynamics of production relationships. These changes have been constantly discussed with the tools and technologies available at each period. Architects and engineers as the primary creators of spatial representation have found themselves in continuous loop of response to evolving spatial practices and representational needs. Please forgive me, this I am taking from um, Henry Lefebvre. Um, if, if students, if you don't understand, ignore it. Historically, production methods were manual and artisanal. Even when craftsmen created similar elements like windows, each piece bore unique characteristics. This inherent variability added richness to the architectural fabric. However, a paradigm shift occurred with the industrial revolution and mass production. Identical products churned out by industries began to dominate the built environment, eroding the distinctive handcrafted nuances of products. Paradoxically, this industrial homogenization also brought a new dimension to spatial representation. The advent of technologies like CNC, computer numerical control, laser cutting machines enables intricate patterns to be etched onto materials like metal um, jallies, walls, etc. Unlike in the past where the imprecision of manual crafting limited choices of quality and quantity, industrial processes emerged to resolve it and in the process eradicate these limitations. Consequently, the diversity in Jali patterns choices expands exponentially. I will suspend the discussion of the advantage of standardization to access quality products in mass compared to the diversity of output the same human skills can do. I will also suspend the discussion that the seed of standardization was always there right from the inception of the evidence of the Stone Age. Curiously, Modern industrial processes are slowly moving towards mass customization within a specific range. Now we are, we are in an era of mass customization, though we are in the early era of mass customization again, providing a fusion of uniformity and individuality. This phenomenon is exemplified by the ability to produce 
varied patterns on metal jali walls through cnc machines showcasing the intersections of industrial efficiency and design variability now what is happening is that we have come to a point where now you can design and machines can produce which means that the that the in, that the production process or the industrial production process is slowly completely getting tuned with the design ideas or way the designers work as the modes of production change with respect to changing economic models the choice of something other than the everyday aesthetics comes with a tremendous cost of labor and capital what is happening is that if you want to customize something today it comes with a very heavy cost today industrial precision eradicated the limitation of the past allowing for intricate and diverse patterns thus privileging a type of visual language of architecture as against the conventional work of the hand so now what it, what it has done is it has changed our our aesthetic preference this transformation represents a complex interplay between market demands technological advancements and architectural responses the evolution from traditional methods to standardized production processes and products like cnc based products or air condition condition environments signifies a noteworthy paradigm shift impacting not only the aesthetics but also the functional and environmental aspects of the contemporary buildings the concept of spatial practice as an outcome of historical forces actors of representations of transformation like engineers planners or architects and inhabitants of the pro produced spaces are in constant flux the inhabitants of spaces constantly modify appropriate and adjust to the spaces of representation representational spaces offer a clue and content for the representation of space to emerge influenced by spatial practices the point to be noted here is that if we assume that the building elements like walls or columns are produced and are as much affected by spatial practices as the representation of spaces they do not necessarily occupy the same meaning as intended by the author but as appropriated by the user what we eventually know from all this is that the relationship with the hand is in continuous change a wall made by hand is work as per lefebvre whereas a wall made by machine is a product both are different formats of riyas or uh, or sadhana i have used both the terms here because um, to separate because the moment we use riyas it comes to music so what i have done is i have i have been constantly using the word riyas or sadhana for me they mean almost the same thing okay uh, though in in riyaz is sometimes used for repetition and and when you use the word sadhana it it does represents uh, a sort of a higher level of of a practice but but when the mo when, when in the write up the the question of self comes in to me it means both the same but the sadhana means that you need a sadhan to practice okay and the same thing you need for riyaz is an instrument to practice so riyaz or sadhana in my humble opinion is between drudgery and greed to eliminate various intimate relationships of mastery over the outcomes which comes with industrial mode when a material engages with the human body however we all appreciate how well one hand saw is designed and 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 produced as compared to the other the brick laying machine requires operators who run and maintain the machine properly as much as riyaz or sadhana as the masons who need to upgrade their hand skills to other skills to sustain and survive the risk of marginalization and courage to adapt to changing circumstances of technology is as much a riyaz as their earlier skills of laying brick with hand riyaz or sadhana means constant learning to make oneself relevant or else all other or else all other paths lead to abyss without a rope riyaz or sadhana in its most conventional sense is a systematic disciplined and sustained practice under the guidance of a teacher both of them need a tool to practice in both cases the tool's purpose is to develop mastery or over the tool or poetically to be one with the tool in that state it is said that the tool reveals its nature or there is no difference between the two 
in is this possible is this at all possible given that rarely two people may even be sorry given that rarely two people may ever be one in their thoughts and actions how can a person be one with the two or or let's say in the case of humans they still have the ability to use their various faculties to communicate with each other what about the tools which is an object is it that the finite clarity of function or use of the tools makes the communication legible even if the object doesn't literally speak is it that the object having its disposition like a saw compels the carpenter to cut it in a particular way which may be understood as good as speaking is it that one being an inanimate tool makes it easier unlike humans since the saw cannot speak and is made to cut the timber perhaps talking to each other would merely mean having a technique that cuts the wood most efficiently so that the body engaging with the tool is least stressed with maximum performance from the tool perspective it would mean that the tool would last much longer if it's used if it's used with proper skills of course in this case the bias is clear towards ease of human use and durability of the tool it is also clear that the tool has been made to carry specific functions and uses into considerations when the saw and the carpenter's body are in perfect relationship we may come to some empirical conclusion about their performance for example it may be compared by giving 30 samples of hand saw to 30 carpenters each using their own ability the tools durability can undoubtedly be measured if the cumulative time for applying the hand saw in all the 30 carpenter cases remains the same by measuring the effect the effectiveness of carpenter skills can be compared is that all or is there something more mysterious than this given the fact that we are discussing technology practice and riyas or is it or is there something more profound to it that we des- that we that my desperate commentary cannot capture something waiting to be realized every time a carpenter applies the same applies the saw i will leave it up to you to smile at this ignorance and my inability to describe more than what has already been done that is all that we have is material both organic and inorganic in space the body and the saw are both made of materials yet one is so called sentient being and the other is an insentient one is aware of the cutting process through training that is why practice the other aids in cutting by cutting in different ways one gets the self awareness of better ways of personally handling tools and the outcome mastering tools is to master the relationship between the body and the tool the tool is merely extension of the body as the tool is itself made by human ingenuity the movement of the carpenter's body to the saw is a complex mechanical link in which a range of similar movement is possible the different operating bodies over the tool based on how each physical body operates may give a close range of results until an established reference is made it is challenging to concretize the relationship between the saw and the body anything other than the ease with which the body acts to cut the block of a wood with with criteria that can be compared and verified in this sense if we all are culturally conditioned to see dance as an evolved practice the maker's body in action is as much a dance expressed through construction returning to the example some carpenters can better handle the same tool made out of the same material and technology as others does this make the relationship of each carpenter to their saw different in its most rudimentary sense i am still trying to figure out 
Suppose we use the outcome based framework to find out carpenter's skills based on the outcome of the saw's durability and not on the relationship between the saw and the carpenter or the subjective experience of the act of cutting. In that case, we can measure the straightness or smoothness of the cutting in a given time. Therefore, each carpenter's relationship with the tool reveals an aspect of the relationship between, between the two in the form of cutting quality. Now, technology use, te the purpose of the technology is to reveal, um, Martin Heidegger um, has written an essay on technology in which you can have a look at it. But the idea of something to reveal is not unknown to us. Um, uh, let me give you a detour here. The fact that uh, uh, in, in case of India, the philosophical traditions were entangled with the religious tradition or the spiritual traditions. The people who were writing on philosophy, their interest was to write on uh, some kind of a self-fulfillment, whatever you want, or self-realization, whatever you want to put it. So their, because their focus was on self-realization, nobody wrote anything on or, or we don't find a lot of work on philosophy of technology, uh, which also means that uh, over a period of time, what all of us need to do is to, is to go back and rewrite, not from the spiritual point of view, but from a, a technical point of view, what could that philosophy like, uh, like if you, if you look at the Vedic text, Upanishads are the philosophical discourse about it. Okay, whereas in Europe you find there was a very strong tradition of writing, critiquing, etc. But sometimes late in some other formats, uh, we'll be able to discuss that. Let me come back. Each manifestation of saw's performance, such as sharpness, cut precision, or cutting duration, reflects its inherent characteristics. When a saw is mechanized, the dynamics between the machine and the wood changes significantly unlike when a carpenter will cut. During each rotation, the machine remains relatively constant and inert compared to the wood. Wood has moisture, it has different grain characteristics. This relationship is influenced by the factors such as varying granular properties and moisture content of different pieces of wood, unlike or different species. Unlike steel, which has a more predictable and measurable behavior, organic materials like wood have inherent characteristics that contribute to unpredictability in their, intera in their interaction with mechanical tools. This distinction emphasizes the dynamic and nuanced nature of working with organic material as opposed to industrially produced material such as steel. In the above case, the carpenter will still handle the wood, but if they are using mitre saw, etc., and press or push timber for cutting, if you are using a band saw or something, you'll have to push it. When a carpenter transitions to an automated cutting process where their primary role is to operate the CAD CAM system rather than physical cutting, the relationship between the artisan and the wood changes dramatically. Computer aided tools introduce new knowledge to effectively guide the machine through cutting operations. As a result, as the relationship between the human body and the tools and techniques for cutting timber changes, the landscape of woodworking technologies, pra technological practices alters and evolves noticeably. This evolution marks a shift from hands-on to a more technologically mediated and knowledge-centric approach, reflecting changing dynamics at the intersection of craftsmanship or skills embedded in bodily action and technology. No more making is a dance. We discussed in the earlier section, the machine does all the dance. This therefore impacts the relationship between technological practice in relationship to Riyaz and Sadhana in many ways. Firstly, the infusion of technology ensures, oh, I have time. Firstly, the infusion of technology ensures a level of predictability and uniformity in the produced outcome. With precision, machines execute tasks without succumbing to external influences, providing users with reliable and standardized products. Secondly, technology integration 
broadens the horizon of possibility in many ways that manual methods often struggles to achieve. The limitations imposed by physical dexterity are transcended, allowing for a more extensive exploration of creative avenues. This departure from traditional constraints opens up new dimensions for users to navigate within their practices. However, this evolution is not without its challenges. The third facet involves the potential redundancy of specific skills. As technology advances, specific manual proficiencies become obsolete, displacing skills and needing individuals to adapt to emerging demands. Lastly, the transformation extends beyond the physical act of creation to the manner in which we gain knowledge. The shift from hands-on tactile experience to a more cerebral and passive interaction with material marks a significant departure. The process evolves from direct handling to a reliance on technology, altering how individuals engage with and understand the materials they work with. Last two minutes. In the various description provided, a constant thread emerges. The human intention to master the act of creation, the, cons the concerted efforts directed towards that goal, and the demand for newer skills. These, uh, when these three cri criteria are met, it raises questions on the enduring attitude of riyas or sadhana, despite changes in tools and technology. A practice is supposed to elevate from one state to, un to another. This is so because it allows to discover the same in different ways, either to reveal its unseen potential or to gain a skill almost flawless in doing the same, like putting one brick over another all their life, in, in, in a lifetime. So the intimate relationship with hand cannot be a sentimental one. As I mentioned earlier, hand is a tool. It is a device to work with other device. In a technological practice, the hand is as much part of, of the tool as the hand saw or miter saw as an extension of the hand. So that completes um, the first part. Um, um, two minutes breather and we'll do the second part, which would be... <laughs> Okay, the second part is where I have put the work. Um, I will talk less. Um, there are a couple of ways in which uh, you can see that um, it's, it's all architectural work that we have been doing. Um, at least six, seven of them I'll show, but I'll show quickly. And I'll, I have picked up um, a kind of drawing which I think can best uh, thematically uh, go in tune with uh, with what I have tried to explain or what I intend to, to show you. Um, so don't expect long description of any project. So I'll pick up specific things of that project to explain you. Okay, so this project, uh, what I'm showing, I'm not showing any academic work. All what I'm showing is the practice that we have been doing. Uh, we run a collaborative practice of with four partners. Um, Manu is an engineer, rest three of us are architects. And um, now we have almost practiced for 10 years. Um, uh, whatever we have struggled so far, we have got uh, so far three act active wings of thumb impression, thumb impression design, thumb impressions furniture, and thumb impressions build. The build and the furniture wing I'll not show you because it will take uh, another time. So I've just put the architecture work for you. At a, at a broader level, all of us are deeply interested in making. Uh, we know how to make things. We can use tools to make. So that's the common thread between uh, all of us. Look, um, can architecture be without a program? Can architecture be, be without a program? Can you do architecture without any meaning? Okay. Now, 
the way we approach architecture uh, for and and I'm again I'm being very specific here is that we think that once the or our hypothesis is that uh, a good architecture is where the relationship between structure construction and program is so well woven that they are indistinguishable um now that's a it's very difficult to find out uh, how to verify that which is indistinguishable okay now out of which i want to distinguish here the relationship between um between structure and construction to the program now if you look at from the knowledge point of view what we have always read is that there is a textbook of structure and there is a textbook of construction there is a discipline of 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 structure there is a discipline of construction now most of the time they are not the same people uh, who are teaching um, or or in some case you may be but most of the cases you may not be there because there is a different discipline that is being operated but for example if you look at this wall can you can you differentiate between what is structure and what is material let's say for example if you are if you are putting a brick over another brick okay if the second brick if the brick that you are laying falls what does what what does that mean it means that there is an imbalance there is some issue with you are not able to balance the cg and therefore when you are keeping when you are keeping it it doesn't balance it falls so the so the body of the maker is also the body of the person who experiences structure through making they are one they are not different because if they fall if if for example it falls it is not structural because it doesn't follow the principle of structure so so what is important for us to understand is that when a mason starts working their body is also the body of a both together but for our own knowledge uh, perspective we have separated out because we study in a studio environment where we say this is structure and this is construction whenever the relationship between structure and construction comes it is far more easier than when the program comes okay because when the program comes there are far more demands that that you have to um, you have to sort of fulfill the result of which you will often find is that the term i was discussing with anuj we use is that now let's set the grid in, in if you if you have worked in office they will say that let's set the structural grid okay because the structural grid is is less important than the organizational or uh, organizational demand for which you are sort of working okay um and so so to have this uh, indistinguishable is a, is a very difficult job um in this presentation i have not put a single plan the purpose of not putting a single plan is that i don't want to right now discuss the problem with the plan in relationship to the structure because the problem of the plan in relationship to the structure comes when you start thinking about not only organization but also the bearing capacity of the plan because in plan you see walls and columns so uh, so just for the for for this presentation i have suspended it because the moment we get into discussion of the plan i'll be compelled to get into discussion of type which which i want to avoid it uh, for some time so so continuous practice is supposed to make the relationship between the three indistinguishable um when you are looking at what we are doing it there are three things what is happening you need to imagine materials are dispersed and achieve their most structurally stable place and configuration in the way they are dispersed that's what i said when i was explaining you the brick it's up to us to pick the most suitable one the relationship between material and structural forces are simultaneous and indistinguishable uh, i will i can also get into the argument that they are separate but once if you ask that kind of a question the relationship of material structure to program is the key struggle one of the biggest it's not so much the struggle with with the structure to construction as much for us is the strug, struggle with the program volumes as a dispersal of material that forms elements that are structured 
So obviously what we are trying to do is we, we think that th that the structure should reveal, which means we need uh, materials which helps us to, to sort of reveal that and also it helps to support the program. So this is the project which we uh, which we did, uh, it's, it's called Yogshala. It's around 24 meters span. Uh, it is, uh, this space is supposed to be used for performance of yoga. Um, okay. Now, there are a few projects in bamboo, so let me explain you the material uh, little bit uh, to get you. Bamboo is a fiber. The, it's a linear fiber the the bonding between two fibers in bamboo is made out of lignin which is weak unlike timber or unlike steel so what what it does is whenever you are trying to handle bamboo and whenever you will drill it you will realize that every time you drill it it will split or if you apply large forces it will split okay but the fibrous characteristics of the bamboo in terms of its tensile property is very high. But what happens is that before you are able to actually use the full potential of the tensile nature of the bamboo, the joinery will fail. So unless and until you don't design a joinery, that, that will not take the full potential of the, of, the, of, the, of the bamboo, of the tensile property, you will never be able to use optimize bamboo. That's why. Second, bamboo is low modulus of elasticity. When a material has low modulus of elasticity, you will find that the material will not come back to the same position very easily. So to imagine spanning in bamboo to, 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 straight, to be straight is very difficult. Okay, so for example, in India, if you are going to span Indian species, of let's say around 70 mm, if you're going to span, span more than 1.5 meters, I'm saying single piece, after six, seven months, you will see sagging. Okay, that is because of the low modulus of elasticity. Now, across the world, you will find uh, all architecture, whatever you have been impressed when it comes to bamboo, using forms which are in compression, which means you'll, you'll find that forms which has got curvature. The purpose of the curvature is to overcome the low modulus of elasticity. The other way to overcome is to bundle it. Okay. Now, how it is different from timber? It is different from timber because timber has got fiber in both the direction. Okay. Obviously, it is not as good as steel. What we call the property is an isotropic property. So, timber, so I am giving a comparison. So, timber, for example, uh, would perform far better in both the direction. Um, as compared to as compared to bamboo and then steel is an isotropic property so steel mediates all organic material why do you use steel in with organic material because steel you can do in xyz axis it performance is same the only thing you have to take care about is that if it is in bending wear depth section size profiles etc having said that so this is almost a straight um, form okay and the only thing what we did was we slightly cambered it. But, so, so, okay, now let me go back and explain you a little bit. So, it is made out of two components. The first component is this curve, okay. So, it's it, what we, you want to call it like a truss. And the second component is an independent arch. Now, after some time, if you make something straight in bamboo, it will sag. So, the redundancy here is designed through the compression member. I'll explain you later once I'll show you the next project. I'm only explaining you the tectonics part of it. And um, so these are some of the details. And I'm, I'm showing you in the sequence in which we work. The moment we conceived that, we got into detailing. Okay, so these are some of the details you can, you can see. Um, in if you have questions, you can ask in Q&A uh, because I... Um, need to um, give you more insights into other projects. So if you see these are the details, this is how they are connected. And the intention here is to partially 
standardize uh, standardize fastener systems in bamboo as a larger idea okay so you find that these are these are this member these member are compression members from the top cord of the trusses you got this members which are coming and resting on the compression so right now these members are almost not working once the sagging starts happen let's say after 10 years or whatever years then this member will start working so the redundancy is built into the structure to get the poetics okay and so this is what you can see uh, and this you'll be able to see once you see the okay this is what the views are okay so dispersal of of material okay not to restrain the material okay this is uh, the project i'm sorry but they have made the sequence wrong anyway okay this is the project which we did in serendipity i'll come back let me go to the next one in the next one if you see this is a solid bamboo and again because there would be a sagging that would happen okay so the above is hollow bamboo the curve you see is solid bamboo we know that the sagging will happen it is it is taken care by by a bent solid bamboo okay and what it does this is again a meeting space for an ngo uh, so again what you do is you you express it and obviously then there are other details which are which are uh, worked out for ventilation and again you see attempt to standardize details okay this is the work which we did for serendipity 2022 when they had asked us to design an installation okay here you will see that the beginning of using of splits okay so so these are these are splits uh, which are which are used in this installation this is an important component of it so if you observe careful this is one a part of the bamboo and this is a split and they are pinned so you can calibrate the distance between the two uh, if you are able to uh, whatever you need to know about it so you see here for example the splits they are held and that component okay so they are pulled okay the the splits are being pulled and then they are held by this vertical members okay so pure tension when you when you hang it when you pull it from down and pull it everything is in tension so it's a pure tensile structure okay so you see uh, you see the bent curvature here there is above and then this this only hangs this is another work which uh, uh we have been trying to think how to standardize um, bamboo for public infrastructure and so this was one triple id workshop in hyderabad where we were invited and um, and so we tried and then we demonstrated it later on of course we also uh, participated in the coa competition but uh, yeah, um, but i don't think uh they would have noticed that part um so these are again standardized detail it can work for for a range of bamboo so how it does is something like this okay so you just buy these parts go and and sort of build it whenever you want you change it okay <laughs> this is a work where we tried post tensioning in bamboo is around 14 meters span okay this is where we failed first time we had to uh actually uh, remove this structure so what happened was uh the section is something like this it's 14 meter and you look at this these are these are post tensioning cables going on inside it but what happened is that we were not in spite of all calibration we were not able to balance it so there was a three two inches um rotation in the structure okay and so we had to remove it since then we have not been able to erected because obviously um you know the relationship with the client changes <laughs> if you if you fail <laughs> uh, this is another um, r and d um, this this is this is a, a new i would not call a new but new articulation we have done for hunarshala roof uh, if you see here 
we know that as I said that the bamboo would sag, the straighter one. So what we have done is we have added a compression member. Then if you look at from here, there is this vertical member which is connecting the rafter, but they don't connect the uh, curve here. They connect from here through a rod. Let me show you a little bit more. This is it. CD. It's, uh, in next 15 days it would be done. But uh, can you see this? So what happens is that this is not connected. So from here it goes to this part. And from there, there is a tension rod here. So what happens is once it starts sagging, the this rod starts working, which exerts force onto the compression. So there is an indirect path which sort of works and not the direct path. And of course, it gives you then the expression and something of this kind. So we've been constantly working to standardize some of these things. You can see the, the close up of that. You can see how the details are worked out. So because we know that the diameter of the bamboo will keep changing, we have reduced the width of the plate to such an extent that you will not be noticing now the relationship between the curve and the and the and the straight plate. This was an R and D we did with students, uh, where you will see that the post tensioning is happening with the splits in seed, uh, and uh, how does it work? So it works again in a different way. So if you look at it. This is a beam, okay, forget about in between thing. This is at the back what you see. Right now only see this front. This is a beam with these vertical members like rods, like your stirrups. Now what happens is this member is connected through a tension rod here and then it is pulled out. There are images I can show you, okay. So this is that, there is a, do you see the tension rod which goes here and connects here? Okay, there is a rod here which goes and connects here. Okay, this further we worked out for the Serendipity Art Festival where we further um, engineered it. I'll show you the images. And then we introduce a new component where we use the parametric, um, um, you know, the parametric design to get the curve. Now, what you need to understand here is that you cannot twist bamboo splits. You have to twist over a large range. So unless and until you will not be able to get what is the length to which you will be twisting it, you will not be able to get the form correct. Okay. So it is sort of parametrically generated and we I have worked on this with my students earlier. You will see at all level there is some degree of pushing the boundary of how the bamboo needs to behave. Okay. So these are some of the images. There is a bamboo here and this curve which you see weaving is basically strengthening this bamboo by inner connection. Okay, so that's an indirect way to do it. This is the rod. This is the post tensioning. Okay, this is from where it starts. This is the end connection. These are all the details. Okay, these are the parts how they are made. This is the end detail. This is the lower portion. You can see they are, they, this portion is cut in order to make the spanning member. Okay. This is a small project which we did. Again, the intention of the project is to show you uh, that the, when the project is small, uh, what we have done here is that instead of using beams, etc., we have used flat slabs. Okay. So what you do is when you use flat slab, within a tighter space you are able to articulate uh, light much better and of course you can work with sections much better so it's around 5.2 meter by around 10 or 10.5 meters uh, yeah. and then if you what happens in the section is that there is a staircase in the center and then you try and build relationship as much as possible okay so you see some of the relationships and then from the other side, you get the light. This is a project, uh, I have an old image, uh, right now it's complete. It's a, it's a, it's a masala factory building. Um, 
uh, was done by a very uh, very low budget. Uh, so we tried and do uh, as much as possible within that. Again, coming together of industrial and natural material. So the depth is mani- is managed by if you see a flitch plate. Okay, but the plate is in is is sort of curved. Okay, and then there are stiffness which you can see here. Okay, and then there are these vaults uh, done by Azad Bhai. And so you can see, so we uh, we are still in the process, it's still in the process of completion. Once it is complete, we'll be able to share. This is again uh, another uh, work which we did, where again you can see dispersal of material. Okay. Um, this is a new project which we have done, which was which is a restaurant project. Uh, the brief was that they needed to dismantle it after ten years. So we wanted to ensure that the recycle value of all the materials are high. Okay, so this is in Surat. Uh, if you see, uh, it is made out of perforated sheet metal, uh, which are sort of stiffened, and then this is just a minimal uh, rod which is there to to avert. Uh, lateral buckling okay and so you can see these relationships and you can see here you can see this see this was the public edge and the client um, it was a little uncomfortable opening up fully, so we tried and open up as much as possible to ensure that the inside-outside connection remains as an urban gesture. But in the night, the idea was that it, it sort of um, comes out, so you can see the relationship from outside to inside. Okay, these are the details. This is what you will see in the evening, and this is the night. So it just lits out. Okay, you can see this from inside. These are the credits. And thank you. I think I'm on time. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sankalpa, for a very, very interesting uh, talk and uh, projects. Uh, I hope there is a lot of questions uh, and um, to begin with I have one. Um, it's always very interesting to see the projects which are built and then it has conceived and you talk about it. But my part remains with the pedagogical understanding. How do you make, how do you teach this to a students? Means how, do you, how do you make aware them of phenomenology of the force or the material? What is what is uh, uh, your stake on that? In two thousand fourteen, when in two thousand fourteen, when uh, Ayaz and myself, we were teaching construction. Uh, we realized that the students in 2014 were different from what we had witnessed in 10, 11, 12. Uh, there was substantial difference because by that time, many students had mobile phones and um, they spent ample amount of time. And you know that... Um, you generally people are not interested in construction in an architecture school and it's very painful to make students interested okay in in lot of ways uh, and i hope that if you have taught construction uh, you will agree with me that it's a difficult job to do it partly because we have also not been able to crack how to get creative students engaged in the process of construction and partly also because um, Students uh, come with their own intentions about uh, about how to take technical courses. But 2014, we realized that all our drawing methods and all these things were not working. 
so I asked, requested Ayaz, and that time I had already come from the side. I had requested Ayaz that let's do one thing. Uh, it, I think 2014, me 2012. Tha. I think 2012. I asked Ayaz that um, let's develop all kinds of um, exercises which are related to making. Because if you are cutting something, you will either cut your finger or cut the paper properly. There is no other way, which means that at least they. At least there will be a pedagogical scope of focus, okay? And that is when we shifted the whole way of, uh, or at least I shifted the whole way of engaging with the students, which I also continued in the in the studio. Uh, so in the studio, um, um, a large part of my working is related to making and and doing modeling experiments. Uh, now modeling experiments means that experiments where students use paper, thread, and things of those kind to engage with uh, with how to strengthen a weaker material. Now, to strengthen a stronger material, or for example, when we are making materials or models with stiffer materials, you don't have to use your intelligence. The moment I ask you to make using thread and using weaker materials, even the walls will not stand properly. What it means is that we have uh, the change in geometry for architects this is the term that i use the change in geometry is the reflection of how failure will happen in that geometry okay so instead of saying that there is a for failure by compression tension this is how the failure will happen which means the change distortion in geometry is how the failure will happen and so because you are engaging in the process of making and, and observing and modifying on your on your own, there's an embodied um, knowledge that, that builds up because it is not based on theorizing it. So, so which means that I'm only engaging at critical points to explain, okay, this is compression, this is how it is working, this is how it is working. So most of the times there is a silent relationship between the work to the students and I'm just witnessing it. Uh, that pedagogy has worked uh, uh, so far. So, um, I mean, worked so far, I will not know. Worked so far, how do I know it? I mean, we'll know it after 10 years when students come and say that it made sense. <laughs> so maybe I'll, I would say that I think it may work, but I don't know whether it works or not. So there's there's this very uh, close relationship between practice for an individual when you're engaged into your own work and experiments. Like you've been working with a team for ten years now, and you've been doing experiments and working through projects. And those projects would fail, or the pro the projects would kind of bring in new learnings. And these, in some ways. Uh, <laughs> can be brought together when you are entering into a classroom and teaching your students. And, uh, and like you said that, you know, like the nature of students have changed. The students who were there in 2010 are much different than in 2024, maybe. And in the classroom is right now, uh, the current way in which we engage with the students is almost like co-learning or collaborating with them. Uh, so. The question which I would like to ask or rather know from you is, are there any particular questions which emerged in the studio, uh, in the classroom, uh, which uh, made you look differently at the projects which you did or made you uh, or formulated new questions for you which you took back into your practice and uh, like it's a vice versa. Really. See, uh, I can respond only from my point of view. I will not be able to respond from how other people think. Um, I, I always felt that I'm a reluctant academic. Um, and um, I, for me, at, you know, teaching is not a change. Um, it is same as, as sort of 
practicing and i really don't come i don't go to practice for a change or neither i go to teaching for a change though they are different things at a foundational level they are all same and um, how they are same i have felt that um now again i am using i am this is my personal view i, I always had deep interest in nature of things um what is the nature of things nature is too abstract a term and over a period of time the only thing which could anchor me was structures because the structural forces were um were measurable but were imaginary because they were measurable and they were imaginary for me it was a big anchor to to sort of work at that plane and 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 if you work i realize that because working at that plane what it does is then the practice and this becomes same but the pra- the practice also requires a, a a way in which one curates the practice because we are we have been also conscious as to how do we curate our practice to practice the way we want uh it is not same as as by saying that we don't get this kind of work we don't this get this kind of work because we don't want this kind of work so for example i want a high rise building desperately to sort of do it a commercial building right now i am not mentally prepared for a apartment building in high rise because for me the question of type um lingers because as structure is essence type is essence and um and those two are anchorage for me now i am i am not doing it and neither i am taking studio because what i am realizing is that for let's say let's say high rise for 200 years we are into high rise not more than that for thousands of year we are into low rise so amount of diversity of things that we have done for low rise we have not done for high rise so if you go to a high rise building you will not get complexity of space you will get cells utilitarian cells so in my mind i'm constantly trying to figure out how do you get complexity of space in a high rise in a flat kind of situation and since i am not i don't have any clue i don't want to use students to explore that i need one anchor i i can think one or two some uh, but but so for me there is no there is a continuity there is no no difference so actually it doesn't happen that uh, from studio i am taking because uh, what because see it also happens see teaching is more difficult than practice because what because every student is different and if when they are experimenting what happens is that if you are a good tutor you would, you are more empathetic to the students which means that if there are 20 students you are thinking from 20 different ways even if you have set the experiment you are think so because the point is whether they get it not you get it not is immaterial they get it not is important because we have to think about they get it not which means for every student i am thinking that okay after two steps what will that person do after three steps what will that person do so so in that sense what teaching does it it is far more compelling intellectually because i think you are far more liberated in practice so um you know um i was just i will i have a question from the first part that you spoke um like taking from the uh, proposition that you made on this uh, the individuality and the mass uh, which kind of becomes um it converges at some point in this mass customization era um I mean furthering that uh, the material and the body also becomes one uh with the example of the saw the hand saw and the uh, cutting of the wood uh because the saw becomes the medium through which um uh, it connects or talks to you um the material even the metal that vibrates or the kind of uh, senses you get through that the machine doesn't uh continuing that this relationship of the body um like i was just wondering what is it for the body in this process of making like 
from like the cutting of this cutting through the saw or can we compare it beyond the act of occupation say the uh, uh, carpenter or maybe the mason uh, to a more performative uh, sense of joy that maybe a singer or a dancer sort of gets and connecting it to the uh, sense of riyas or the sadhana or the sadhan the tool uh, and and how does it locate itself uh, in the architectural process like the because there is a certain um, transition which happens from say the make the imaginer to the maker or the thinker to the maker and is this a question of the agency or like how does say one practice uh, think about it that's that's one and to kind of take it a little bit further is it the relationship that you brought in through the idea of the aesthetics and the precision because um, like it has like is it the question of the precision then or is it the question of the aesthetic then i don't want to necessarily separate these two but but that was a question for me when you know uh, this was being discussed or or the agency through which you achieve the aesthetics um and and maybe like is that uh, like where does riyas also locate within this and how does it shape maybe a practice for you like and now right now you just mentioned about the economics not being different than say your uh, then 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 the projects that you do so like I, this was like a question for me in, uh, and maybe if you, if it can reflect on this or well, see see the thing is um, like architects being sensitive being there um, there is a tendency of loss okay and that is why i wanted to point out two things one hand as a sentimental thing and the second is um when i was trying to explain um i wanted to explain a person who is most disempowered you a carpenter will not cut on their own because they enjoy it okay which is different from let's say dancer you can still dance whenever you want you can still sing whenever you want okay so for a, we have to understand or for for it we have to understand for that person what would that be okay and i was trying to give an example that look tomorrow for a for tomorrow mitre saw has come day after something else will come something else will come they are the one who is most marginalized unless they shift their skills okay now how do you look at that condition because all rest of the conditions are far more privileged condition for us if it changed to ha- hand to autocad i didn't see i mean I- i'm a person people who who are in this uh, late mid 90s to early 2000 people who have studied all of them for them both hand and computer they were using it at least i was using both hand and computer okay so the but but there would be people who be coming okay you have to use hand because you don't get skill all of these have failed okay still there are better architect architecture being done the tools and technologies are changing which means that what is constant is an attitude to get something okay so today you are using let's say uh, not today let's say five years back seven years back you were using sketchup and models model for outside and sketchup to go inside and detail out things okay so so what is happening is that you have got far more dexterity than than any other time in the history and today with perhaps ai you will get far more options than any other time in the history where is the problem the the so the problem comes when we when we think that there is a loss if we if we think that there is an opportunity every time then we'll have to constantly adapt to it now the only thing is if you are privileged you have far more choices than a carpenter because let's say a carpenter in 40s they, from there they shift to mitre then they shift so what unless until they don't become entrepreneur they will not be able to get some some of the stuff and so what happens is slowly redundancy starts happening 
ओके सो सो व्हाट रिमेंस टू मी कांस्टेंट इन रियाज एंड एवरीथिंग इज व्हाट इज द एटीट्यूड विथ व्हिच यू लुक एट चेंज इन टूल्स सो सो लेट्स से व्हेन द माइटर सो कम स्टिल यू सी द कारपेंटर्स गो एंड प्रेइंग विश्वकर्मा द समथिंग एल्स कम दे स्टिल डू द सेम थिंग दे ओपन अ फैक्ट्री दे स्टिल डू द सेम थिंग दे कट इट दे स्टिल डू द सेम थिंग Similarly, there is something constant which we are doing with changing tools. So, the point is that repetition or doing doing same things does not mean you are doing same things. Because let's say if what I wanted to show with the work here, the same bamboo, if you are dealing with it, but you are trying to push yourself to to find out can there be more ways? Can there be more ways? So the same bamboo reveals itself in different ways. not because you are some enlightened person simply because you are doing donkey work and you are do, you are spending far more amount of time in one particular thing so that's what um um that's what uh, is the way i am i am sort of uh, thinking about it because any other way if i don't think that hand is a tool this is also a tool if i start thinking that no this is different you know i mean it starts it 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 goes into an abyss and once you go into that abyss and if you don't know how to return back there is no returning back and 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 we have found out that many of the times all of us have this sometimes tendency to go there and i have been trying to look at okay things have been changing and still you have been seeing better things coming out okay so that's that that is going on in the in, in my mind um so how do we reinvent hand and um, we have to see i mean i see the thing is instead of working you are jogging now you are still using your body you realize by sitting and doing computation you will not be able to make your body healthier the relationship has changed uh but also we make for like ourselves like what i also wanted to bring out is um like i also make a few things or maybe with milin we make a few things uh with the students by ourselves and there is the connection there like you also make for joy um even though it's not for um an occupation or maybe it's not in, that's where the uh the gap between the uh imaginer or the thinker and the maker because uh what it highlights or what it brings out is this is these kind of gaps or the questions of um the aesthetic because it's an agency that one wishes to make it in a particular way but is there a dialogue is there a certain sense of because it was there in the projects that you were uh, bringing out like working with bamboo and much more intuitively like the learning of um, the structure is more intuitive rather than uh, you know doing it in say a grasshopper script or some other uh, material because you are sensing that so this is where i wanted to sort of know how you uh, get into the riyas like how is your relationship with the uh, the person who is making it now the craft person who is uh, involved there okay see i think that um, the craft person is doing their job i am doing my job now there are human relationship between the craft person between the student between everybody how do we treat it how do we approach it what is our overall attitude to approaching okay now uh, see we have to also understand is that the the people whom we are working with have a particular skills which are very good okay but here you are also trying to work with different forms that the skill can give you okay now in which sometimes so for example once you make it like let's say uh vasan bhai is the artisan with which we have done all experimental structure in in bamboo so once we do that experiment it shows say that will it work uh, not in the model stage because model stage they don't understand thing once we are putting up that prototype which we do for all the project then we say work karega then he will he will sort of say but it depends on artisan to artisan okay. what i am trying to constantly say here is that um see the 
I don't necessarily think there is an intuitive process. I personally think that when trying to work for a long period of time and struggling and pushing oneself, you see the same thing in a different way. Because we are bi- our eyes are biased towards the knowledge that we have. It is, it, is, it is the way we are constructed. It. So, for example, all of us are looking at the same object, but we see different why. Because our, we are colored by our knowledge, and our knowledge only gives, gives that much. We don't see everything. We never see totality. So, we are never one with it. This whole idea, so that's why I wanted to bring, there is nothing like one with it, because you are different. One of the reasons why I have problem with anthropology, but this is my personal problem, I, I mean, it, is the fact that a society worldview or cosmology is of a certain kind. It may be wrong, but you still say that that's the cosmology. So it's unto itself, which may not be the truth. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm, I would not get into the question of agency. What I'm, there is an interaction which is very dignified, very respectful. It is. It comes with the joy. It brings it, but there is a lot of luxury. So that is why I wanted to present to the students in a. I am not sure whether I have been able to do it in a non-romantic way. Because you have to see as things are. Because if we don't see, then there is a problem. So, uh, I wanted to ask that uh, how does the larger world, including the fields of art and architectural practices, influence and shape your rias? In what ways does the external context impact the way you approach and engage with your chosen medium? And uh, when I say that uh, the larger world, I also uh, question the role of asymmetries and imperfections and unexpected elements uh, that impact your uh, impact your practice of riyas. I mean, uh, how do they contribute to the evolution of your work in some way? Well, I didn't want to touch the words like asymmetry, etc. <laughs> Um, for for the reason that I have not thought from that point of view. So it would be unfair to talk in the direction in which you have not worked. Uh, so so the purpose of, of putting it there is to put the areas in which you have worked. Otherwise it would become, um, you know, you're speaking something but unnecessarily trying to prove that this is what you're doing. As far as externalities are concerned, um, See, what my realization is that there is one area in which uh, my team members may have a different viewpoint, but there is one area in which I wanted to be on the edge of the world. That um, edge of the world means that, okay, there are a few things which I have showed you nobody has done in the history. Okay. And if somebody, what, they, so, so which means that I am also constantly seeing what others are doing. Okay, what it has also done to me as a person, I can say that um, I have tremendous respect when I see somebody doing something nice. Because to get to that level, I know that if I have to achieve something, it, it takes tremendous effort and a very long time work to sort of do something. So the moment you see in somebody, including students, etc., uh, one is more able to appreciate that. Uh, a very deeper appreciation comes in when when you see other people doing good. Is what is what it does, and this is how I, I sort of look at it. Hello, hi. Uh, I want to extend from what Dushint was kind of you know pointing at where you were talking about a dance that happens between a person who is working with wood. So I wanted to reflect upon my personal uh, kind of an experience. Back in my 10th standard, we had a subject called technical drawing and we had this half imperial sized board and we had to draft these small kind of engineering tools. They had punctures and small, small kind of things. So the way I internalized them back in the day and the way today how we conceptualize larger architectural spaces it is very different. Like my question is that is there a is there a difference in the consciousness between a mind and the body that happens 
when it, these medium shift when you start you know graphite on paper on paper and maybe graphite ka uh, style on procreate or you know how does that uh, like you were talking about that mitre joint saw and how does a person chisel a 45 degree kind of a cut is there a difference in the consciousness that that emerges maybe we are more precise but is there a difference in the consciousness that is emerging as practitioners as designers or maybe as people who are practicing okay i don't have any answer for that um because i why i don't have answer because look um see consciousness today um is a big area of work in the field of science um a lot of scientific work are being done more than it was ever done um and there are various views on consciousness and because there are various views on consciousness there are various views on relationship of consciousness to body okay um or let's say consciousness to the universe because uh, uh so um, i can tell you that some people think that um um universe is within consciousness some people think consciousness is within universe some people think consciousness and universe are 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 separate uh some people think um consciousness and uh, and um the universe are inseparable okay now each of the way in which you conceive it you will articulate your your uh, ideas accordingly it will so so i don't know how are you looking at it the moment you say that consciousness and universe is separate and they mix that philosophy is called sankhya if you say consciousness is within universe okay um um then you will have uh, all the material philosophy okay if you say the other way around you will have all the religious philosophy okay now which means that the relationship of body to the consciousness depends on how you are trained to to look at it so so that's why i say i am not capable of answering your question because i don't know how to explain that i mean i don't even know is there something called consciousness or not okay or, or or for example that consciousness emerges through a physical condition science says that give us another 50 years we will prove that that material creates consciousness okay and you know so so this these discussions are very difficult to have and i don't want to have this discussion because Uh, one that i am not an expert in, in it and it may be misleading to you as well if i if i say something at that and that doesn't make sense to it so sorry i cannot answer this question Well, yeah yeah um sankalp it's always a pleasure to have you at see and hear your talk as well as see your work um um i have um uh, i mean i i really enjoyed both the parts of your presentation and i have two questions um in thinking about what you presented um um their their questions but also maybe provocations for your um memorial lecture uh, so my first uh, point is about the analytical framework that you presented of structure construction and program and in kind of uh, and type which becomes important uh, for you to kind of explore i'm reminded of one of the points that you had mentioned uh in a design dissertation symposium at c i think it was in 21 or 22 that the detail of structure is not simply the structure which comprises of material but is also the detail of life and that those words i will never forget 
And so I'm kind of wondering that when one sees your work and all, all the work that you showed in the second part, is there something beyond the unity of force and form in the structure and construction and the time? Is there something beyond that in terms of detail, in terms of experience that this work opens up? Something that may possibly be, you know, uh, one might be able to kind of reflect on it as one is doing the work, but kind of when one is reflecting back on a longer body of projects, one might be able to articulate that. So is there something that is emerging in, because I mean, those structures, those, 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 those uh, the expression of structure, material and program was evocative. And I think Dushant was kind of alluding to that. So analytically, does this do something more? Because the title of your talk also kind of alluded to this. And my second point was, what might happen if instead of uh, distinct, I, I mean, like you presented first uh, a historical overview of mass production standardization versus artisanal production and craft, kind of a, uh, a, a fairly well-known history. If one kind of thinks through the talk, not in these two parts, but in talking about mass production and artisanal production or crafting and standardization, as one discusses the project itself, how might we be able to change that narrative? So these are my two points, whether there is a possibility. You know, I see the thing is, um, you're right. Um, and uh, I'll think about it. My, there's a personal difficulty here that I want to restrain myself to getting into phenomenological description because um, I want to remain very close to something which is tangible. Um, though my interests are there, I do not want to reveal it. Uh, and this is a conscious um, decisions or, or conscious attempt I have been doing since many years. And um, uh, including in studios as well. When somebody does concept, or something, I would not spend too much time on that and get into this because I have not been able to uh, decipher um, the underlying structure of experience. And because I have not been able to do it, you can keep writing to writing about it. Okay, so perhaps what you pointed out that relook at this relationship and try and see could sort of anchor it. But I'm 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 very careful not to put it because, as I said that uh, when I was a student, I uh, you know you felt misleading discussions going on. Okay, which you cannot relate, you cannot anchor it. And so you become very careful. I am very careful to put something which I think is is, is possible to to sort of discuss um, because the phenomenological frame or the framework of experience. Yes, I mean, say some of the things one is doing is to is to think. I have not put some of the uh, some. There are few more works which I could have put um, because those work I am conceiving as a type. And then anchoring it to structure and sort of sort of construction. In my imagination, there is a thought on how the darkness would sort of um, build into that space and how less light you need. Okay, but then I can't explain why you are doing it. So I'm very, you know, there is something going on in my mind. Okay, but because there is no, there is no, I can't put a structure to it. I don't speak. So to respond to that, this is what is going on truthfully. Uh, but what you have said, I'll think about it. And that is why I separated it out. with your provocation on the detail of life becoming an entry point to think 
about drawing an experience, like drawing out something which is the drawing out of life in detail vis-a-vis -vis the exploration itself. And something that could pursue beyond, could be pursued as an exploration, as a reflection, but also an exploration beyond the completion of the project itself, that it may not be apparent while designing it, but one might be able to, in reflection, be able to think through things that one may have observed, notes that one may have made, reflections that one may have had to kind of build on this. So I'm not kind of yeah, yeah. getting into the intangible kind of, but with your own provocation on the detail of life. Uh, hi, uh, I had. I mean, this is two related questions. Uh, something you know, also connected to what uh, Rohit was talking about. Uh, so the the two sections, you know, uh, that he presented. So the first part is about the mastery, right? Uh, and the second part about uh, you know the kind of project he showed, which is to do with you know, largely sort of finished work, right? Uh, and in the title, you sort of talk about the pedagogy of the everyday, uh, and it sort of also reminded me of uh, you know the Russian constructivist uh, artworks about it, it, the whole idea of looking at objects as uh, you know uh, sort of comrades of the everyday, uh, in the sense of you not necessarily want of mastery of it, uh, but you're working with you know bamboo and like material. Uh, to create uh, everyday things. Uh, and I was wondering, you know, if the kind of project shift to the, the experiments or the things that you're working with bamboo that don't necessarily finish, uh, do they allow you to have a different relationship and an idea of what technology is uh, in the sense of that it's not, might not necessarily be, you know, getting a mastery to uh, put a structure together uh, but working with bamboo uh, to do other things. As I was wondering if, you know, uh, are there other kinds of projects which don't necessarily end up there, uh, like architecturally, you know, the structures, but uh, like you're working with bamboo and their different relationship opens up uh, in the everyday of, you know, what technology really is. Well, uh, I would say that uh, mm -hmm. there are two ways to look at it, uh, or two ways I have tried. One way is that um, material is properties. And when you shift from timber, which has its disposition to the one like steel, where you measure it, you created it. Okay. Um, you are trying to make a material of the desired property you need. Steel is a desired property which we need. That's why we have steel of various categories. When you are physically working with material, it's a different experience. When we are not physically working with material, then it's a different experience. Now, bamboo, for example, or any, I would like to say later on when we did steel. So one way to conceive it is to always look at from the structural forces and to see what new diagrams are possible. And so materials adapt to that diagram, which is, which is a way which I try. The, so, but for bamboo, I have done lot of lots of students' uh, workshop, lots. I don't now remember how much I have done. In every project, I have tried to push to do something different than the other. Because for me, it gives, it has given me an R&D for which I don't have money. 
So the pure tensile structure came when I did my first MSU workshop in which um, uh, uh, a very good artist, uh, he, um, he invited me to do it. So that was where I first tried using splits. Okay. And then, and that was an experiment. Okay. I got little confidence about it. Then I moved to the next stage and I did something else. So many of these experiments see, I have done in ba bamboo has resulted into this. The same does not apply for steel because steel is far more measurable. I don't need to do so much experiment in sort of uh, steel to, to, to sort of do that. So, so yes, um, there are a lot of experiments which I have not put up here. Uh, including now I have worked on develop with a couple of friends to to develop standardized fastener system for splits in India, which we are trying to file some intellectual property related stuff, which could be open. Um, I don't know whether we'll get it or not. And we are further working on other dimensions of it for a, for a, for a different reason is that Indian bamboo species is not straight all the time. So either you can wait for another 30 years for introduce variety or you can get standardized split sections, which you start working in various ways. And my larger idea was that, okay, you know, how do you respond to your time? Because even Louis Kahn and all of those, or let's say Kobe, all were responding to their time, whether you like it or not. We are responding to a time where we have to respond to density, we have to respond to environment, etc. And so my pra pragmatic position is how do you mix industrial and natural material? Because that's the immediate thing we can do for ne next 30, 40 years because we can't go extreme ways. It's extremely violent to go extreme ways. Okay. So, so, uh, so working with, so that has happened with working with material and some of the other thing has happened by approaching it through structure. So, um, so I would say both are, both are relevant and, um, both gives interesting outcomes. But, uh, for this occasion, I have not showed, um, yeah, because I really didn't think the way you thought about it. Hello. Yeah. Any question? Sorry. Yeah, I think um, I will thank uh, Sankalpa for this very interesting and uh, every time I like the uh, the clarity with which you speak and you you are focused about your research work and doesn't get diverted with this lot of other things and always very focused on what you want to achieve. It's a very, very, uh, uh, very, very interesting and very, very difficult for me to think through. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Thank you everyone to to uh, to join this uh, and uh, we will uh, see you next in the C conversation which will be on 2nd of February and uh, you know, we have with us uh, Afra Aisma and, and, and during the talk she will take us through the her recent exhibition a use of a craft techniques uh, for storytelling and amplification of voices and understanding of the feminist years through the practice of making soft sculpture and weaving different words so uh, this this would uh, this conversation will be online on uh, zoom platform and we will share the links uh, in a due course of a time uh, thank you everyone goodbye